Well, now that is a very small drop in a very, very large bucket of drugs. Look out at this wasteland. Looks like chaos. But there's always somebody behind the wheel. There you are, you little killer. Outstanding. I was beginning to think it was impossible. I truly started to believe that there wasn't even a remote chance that Hollywood would be able to adapt any video game franchise faithfully. Because one need only look at the recent attempts to adapt a video game franchise to realise how catastrophically it can go. Especially when the ones put in charge of the project don't care about the source material. As they use the franchise name in vain while they tell their new and improved stories, that no pre-existing fan wanted or asked for. So when the Fallout show was announced all the way back in 2020, I wasn't particularly excited. And this is even before a AAA studio absolutely butchered their adaptation of one of the most popular gaming franchises in recent history. So having seen Hollywood's adaptations of the various other franchises in the three and a half years since Fallout was announced, it would be fair to say that my scepticism actually increased. But here I float, pleasantly surprised at what I've just watched. The Fallout show is what happens when a talented filmmaker is given the opportunity to work on an IP that they not only have passion for, but also have a clear vision on how to adapt. Talent, passion, vision and respect are four things that must work in unison if you're going to nail your adaptation. And the respect piece that has been sorely lacking with the recent adaptations is probably the most important part. Aaron, he was saying that, uh, out of the two of you, you were the bigger gamer. You were more into the game than him. Jonah himself, he played a lot of it. Yeah, was that a game. complete waste of time or did that feel like you no. were kind of prepping for the it show? It wasn't a waste of time at all. I, I wanted to get the absolute most out of this experience and I think you have to deeply, deeply respect the source material, um, at least for me. And I love to throw myself into all of my research, but this was so fun. There's so much lore and so much passion behind the games and so many details and it made it even more exciting when I put the Volt suit on or the Pip-Boy for the first time like that moment was not lost on me what a big deal that was um, so no, it wasn't a waste of time because even if you bungle the execution at least fans can see that you gave it your best shot but fortunately for us all Jonathan Nolan can talk the talk and walk the walk the aesthetic the tone the characters and music are just some of the pieces of the puzzle that have been so well put together with this show but I don't expect you to just take my word for it. So join me on an uncharacteristically pleasant dive as we take a look at the Fallout show. I'm of two minds about how to talk about this show because I want to talk about it in great detail because there's plenty of great detail to discuss. But at the same time, it is such a good show and adaptation that I don't want to spoil it for those who haven't seen it yet. So I'll err on the side of caution and speak in general terms. There will be some spoilers, but I'll do my best just to give you the wave tops so you can still go and enjoy the show if you haven't seen it yet. I'll also flag major spoilers before I talk about them so you can skip ahead if that's what you're after. But I would actually encourage you to pause this review and go and watch the show for yourself first before joining me on this dive. Because if you like the Fallout games, hell, even if you're just a fan of good television, Fallout is 100% worth your time. But don't worry, I'll still be here in 8 hours after you've watched one of the best video game adaptations I think's ever been committed to screen. A disclaimer, I am somewhere between a casual fan to an actual Fallout fan. My introduction was Fallout 3, I then played New Vegas and Fallout 4. My personal favourite is 3, but I played the shit out of all three entries. So from a bias of passion perspective, I am not a lore expert, nor am I as invested in Fallout as I am with Halo as an example. I just want to clearly set the expectation before we continue. Righto, with that said, be warned, mild Season 1 Fallout spoilers are inbound. 
The first and foremost, I don't want to undersell how difficult the task of adapting a much loved video game franchise must be. I say this because there is literally a graveyard of failed projects all the way back from 1993's Super Mario Bros. right the way through to the latest season of Halo. For every success, there are a dozen failures. So I can imagine Fallout would have been an even more daunting task, as the Fallout role-playing games are popularised by the player's ability to make choices that affect the story, world and ending. As a player, you also have a level of customization from the outset with your character's appearance, background, skills and personality, and that's not to mention the joys of mods. In short, every person's Fallout experience will be individual, based on their playstyle and preferences, which would make the games fiendishly difficult to adapt. So how do you strike it well in a completely different medium? How does the viewer see the karma and choice systems that are so intrinsic to the DNA of Fallout? And more importantly, how do you please the collective audience who may have drastically different playstyles? The showrunners have created a fairly elegant solution to the problem, by writing three different characters that champion the variation of moral choice to the problems of the wasteland. Lucy the Vault Dweller is the paragon for good and morally justifiable choices. She strives to live by the Golden Rule, which is to treat others how you would like to be treated. Maximus is the emissary of moral ambiguity. A victim of circumstance and opportunity, he makes both morally good and morally bad choices, and is the neutral balance of the show's character archetypes. The ghoul is the renegade, the shoot first, shoot some more, and then when everyone's dead, steal their stuff and shit in their shoes character that represents the morally bad. Between the three characters, we get a broad spectrum look at the sort of choices that get made on a day-to-day -day basis in the wasteland. The show spends an equally fair amount of time with all three characters, whose paths naturally cross throughout the season. Watching how each character approaches a situation of moral choice is one of the many joys of the show, as it highlights the strengths and weaknesses of each character, and inevitably strikes a chord with fans of the games as they consider how they would have approached the same situation. The plot borrows the very Fallout appropriate trope of the kidnapped family member, when, spoiler alert, Lucy's father is taken from Vault 33 by raiders. Lucy then ventures out into the wasteland with a gentle heart, tight, feminine, soft, yet toned core, <clears throat> and a can-do attitude in search of him. Okie dokie. Much like in the games, the basic plot of a kidnapped or disappearing family member is merely the catalyst to get the main quest started and push the protagonist out of their comfort zone and into the wasteland. But as we all know, the real fun comes from the side quests. On her journey, Lucy encounters many of the iconic Fallout prerequisites. Eccentric side characters, raiders, cultists, fellow vault dwellers, and of course, monsters and ghouls. Ella Purnell does a wonderful job as Lucy, bringing a wholesome and innocent portrayal of a character well out of her depth, and it was a nice change to watch her character actually struggle and grow throughout the show. There's been a trend of rather insufferable and infallible female leads in Hollywood over the last 10 years or so. Characters that don't complete a traditional hero's journey and just sort of breeze through the problems of their stories. Because modern writers seem to be labouring under the impression that strength can only come from being physically stronger or smarter than your opponents, failing to realise that it is in fact the struggle of a character that the average audience member identifies with. And to be completely honest, I was fully anticipating this to be the case with Fallout, particularly given that it was written by the same creators as Westworld, which 100% fell into this trap post season one. Fortunately, Lucy is not immune from the horrors of the wasteland. In fact, she gets knocked around more than Charlize Theron in Atomic Blonde. She's forced to learn from her mistakes and grow as a character but at the same time she maintains her sense of optimism and her commitment to trying to do the right thing by others. By the season finale, she's been totally put through the mill both physically and emotionally, and this pluckiness made her a joy to watch even as the weight of the plot demanded her to break her golden rule. Walter Goggins and Aaron Motten do equally good work with their characters, but if I was splitting hairs I'd have to give the MVP to Goggins. His performances of both the Ghoul and Cooper are one of the highlights of the show for me, bridging the gap between the pre-war and post-bomb stories, providing a bit of important context for those who may not have played the games, but also raising a fairly loaded lore question that we'll touch on later. All the principal performances are solid and backed up by a decent to good ensemble cast, with one obvious exception. The fuck were they thinking every time I walk into my own house, my own voice saying, hello sir, do you want to sit down? <laughs> 
It's fucking awful. I'm simply going to harvest your organs. Huh? Whomever had the idea of casting Matt Berry as Codsworth didn't get paid enough. While not many side characters' performances are going to win awards, they're all serviceable and don't distract too much from the main plot, which is fortunate because there's a lot of them. But the real highlight of the show is the attention to detail in the production design. The level of respect and dare I say reverence for the source material is clearly on display with the sets and props that look like they've come straight out of the games. It wouldn't even be fair to call the little things easter eggs because every element of the games has been replicated in immaculate detail. This is more than window dressing, it is physical world building. At the micro level there's nuka cola bottles, sugar bombs, stim packs, weapons, chems and costumes and they're perfectly translated into live action props which gives the show a sense of legitimacy it's like I'm watching the game come to life the sound department have also crushed it iconic sound effects and music have been lifted straight out of the games and it's fantastic after all there's no need to fix what isn't broken hmm saying that feels kind of wrong talking about a Bethesda property all of this just works it's not, I'm not kidding. Stop right there, criminal scum. Nobody breaks the law on my watch. This is all helped by the use of physical sets and actual locations, all of which are tangible for the actors who physically react to their environments rather than faking it for a green or blue screen. CGI is used sparingly to enhance pre-existing locations or to add elements that couldn't be done for either physical or fiscal reasons. And it goes a long way to selling the wasteland as a real and explorable place the same way it is in the games. Here are these games in which you have these epic vistas, you have this vision of a world that's been completely transformed, then all the way down to every object that you can pick up. You can read the journals that people have left behind, the comic books, uh, from, from the sublime to the particular. Every detail of this world is kind of explorable. So to give the audience that feeling, that feeling of a universe in which you can simultaneously feel the grandeur of it, but also the detail of it, was something that, you know, I, I'd happily take credit for it, but it's really our incredible crew, uh, led by our production designer, Howard Cummings, who, who just, you know, with a love for the material and the games, and we had a lot of fans of the games on our crew, just faithfully building out this universe. Nailing both the micro and macro elements of world design is something that many adaptations have struggled to do but Fallout has bloody nailed their aesthetic. If I was being super critical, I would say that some locations look like someone went a bit overboard with their green foliage modding, but I'm willing to accept the real life foliage if it means the show is shot in real locations with actual dilapidated and abandoned buildings because it looks great and it's hard to plausibly fake that stuff on a budget. The creature effects are also a blend of practical and digital and again, it was fantastic to watch an actor physically tangle with something tangible, firing pyrotechnics that interact with blood squibs that spatter across the set. As for the tone of the show, once again, the showrunners and directors need to be given credit here. The Fallout franchise is a bipolar experience of dark comedy and horror that can swing on a dime depending on which quest you're playing at any given given time. For one minute you're picking through desiccated corpses of your fellow humans looking for caps in order to buy ammo, and then the next you're watching two morons dressed as supervillains trying to conquer a township. Now fool, tremble before the might of the antagonizer. You'll never get away with terrorizing this town, not while it's under the protection of the mechanist. Player choice plays a huge part in how you individually experience Fallout, because the game can be as comical or as horrific as you play it. And I personally think the show has struck a good balance between the two. Not all the jokes land, but I never felt tonal whiplash moving from joke to horror to drama, which is no mean feat. And I think Jonathan Nolan needs to be given the bulk of the credit on that particular front. And I just got sucked in by the incredibly expansive, immersive world of the game, but also the, the tone of it. It's so weird, it's so unique. It's dark, it's violent, it's funny, it's goofy, it's political, satirical, subversive. It's all the things that I like in one package and that doesn't usually work, right? It's not usually all things to all people, but for me in these games, especially with the, with the, the degree to which you could explore them, you really could, you could pack all of these wonderful things in there. So we've tried to with the series. Don't get me wrong, the show's not perfect. There are plenty of modern day Hollywood DEI progressivisms in the mix, and if you're hypersensitive to that sort of stuff, you may be inclined to call the show woke. 
I personally hate the term because it's far too generalist, lacks nuance, and is the equivalent of pigeonholing your critique so you don't really have to think about it. Why are you gay? And I don't think this particular critique applies to Fallout, because despite the show being quite progressive with its casting, the showrunners are creative, competent and smart enough to work within the constraints of modern hiring policies without compromising on the story. Because there is no way a quote-unquote woke show would allow a female protagonist to be duped into having sex, only to get bashed, stabbed and taken prisoner by a man. There is no way it would allow harm to befall a trans actor's character, which ultimately removes them from from being central to the story's plot. There's no way it would allow a strong independent woman of colour to leave the fate of the world in the hands of a man who works for the hyper-masculine bastion of mechanically overpowered patriarchy champions. But basically, Fallout is diversity done right, which shouldn't be a shock to anyone who's played the games, as they've always been very rich in their diversity of character. Yes, sir. Vestal reporting for duty. Please assume the position. The actors, just like the props, are there to enhance the world of the wasteland and tell a fallout story. And for the most part, they've done a stellar job. I've got some personal criticisms for sure, and if I had to pick barnacles off an otherwise sturdy hull, I'd say I'm getting a little sick of the subversion of the military trope, peeling back the armour only to reveal a scared little boy hiding inside. But it's a personal bias point for me, and the show freely admits that the Brotherhood of Steel isn't the powerhouse it once was, so I guess I'll let it slide for now. Some of the plot points were a little convenient at times too, and there were some moments that were downright contrived. Seriously, if I see one more scene where the soldiers are defeated by somebody turning the lights out, I think I'll scream. But overall, I had far too much fun with the other elements of the show to pay it too much mind. As for the lore controversies, the show either retcons or violates two rather significant pre-existing lore points, at least to my casual eyes. Be warned, massive season 1 spoilers are inbound, so skip to this timestamp if you want to avoid that. The first is the firing of the nuke that ended the world. In the law, it was originally Communist China that fired the first shot, which led to a chain reaction of counter-missile fire that destroyed the planet. This made sense in terms of the Sino-American Great War, as China had recently been defeated at the Battle of Anchorage in January 2077. They were also on the back foot with the American invasion of mainland China. So their hope was to strike all major military cities in the US and cripple the US's ability to command and control. It was an everything on nothing type of gamble, which ultimately led to the mutually assured destruction of the planet. However, in the show, which is canon to the games, it is heavily implied that vault fires the first nuke. This is done to ensure the success of capitalism, leaving the big tech corporations of the US with the ultimate monopoly over all the survivors. I know in the games vault was sketchy at best, given all their experimentation, but this seems a little bit Bond villainy for me. And while I'm no economist, I can't imagine the company's bottom lines would look too flash after the global banking system was destroyed by EMP. In real world terms, I guess I understand why Amazon made this change so as not to offend the Chinese entertainment market and miss out on those precious international dollars. But personally, I didn't care for the change. I mean, it's not like the game really points fingers after it's all said and done, because regardless of who shot first, the end result was still the same. But as I said, it's not confirmed whether Vault Tech went through with their plan, but on the balance of probability, it looks pretty bloody likely. The other, and for many fans, more contentious change is the nuclear destruction of Shady Sands and, by extension, the New Californian Republic. For those unaware, Shady Sands is the principal settlement of Fallout 2 and the first city founded by the NCR, whom are a principal faction in the Obsidian-produced Fallout New Vegas. The only modern Fallout game not produced by Bethesda. Anyway, New Vegas is widely considered the fan favourite of the franchise, and is set in the year 2281. There is a widely held belief that Todd Howard, Bethesda's game director and executive producer, harbours a personal dislike toward New Vegas and resents the success that it found under Obsidian Studios. While Howard has never personally stated anything as such, the lack of references to New Vegas in Fallout 4 was enough evidence for a witch hunt from some New Vegas loyalists. If there was cause for mistrust and speculation about Howard's alleged dislike for New Vegas before, the show has done nothing but throw fuel on that thermonuclear fire. 
The show is set in 2296 and indicates that Shady Sands and the NCR were bombed in 2277. And yet there is no mention of this rather significant event in the New Vegas game, leading people to speculate that the game is being pushed out of the Fallout canon timeline as a result. Although the show does end on a reveal of New Vegas, admittedly in a state of ruin, and does set up Mr. House as one of the fools that sold the world, I guess there's a bigger plan at play here. But adding further insult to injury for New Vegas fans, what is left of the NCR, whom were made to look like raiders throughout the show, were all but slaughtered to the last man by the Brotherhood of Steel in the season finale. Not to mention the iconic NCR armor being relegated to that of sun protection for cap farmers that fall victim to bandits and bounty hunters the likes of which they used to dispatch with their anti-material rifles. So the NCR really got nothing in the way of love from the showrunners or producer. Nay, worse than nothing! So at least in the opinion of this jellyfish, I can see enough evidence to this claim to warrant the online concern. While I appreciate the frustration of watching your favourite faction not get the ending you felt that they deserved, this treatment is less affronting than a lore disparity to the greater whole, as it is based on a personal preference, rather than being a flaw in the writing. The timeline faux pas, however, is either a massive oversight on behalf of the New Vegas Continuum, or it's a deliberate retcon. Either way, not ideal in a show that otherwise sticks the landing from a lore point of view, at least as far as I can see it. But I will freely admit I am not a Fallout scholar. Otherwise, I think Fallout has done an exceptional job of adapting the source material into a new medium that should please the majority of Fallout fans and even drag a few non-gaming normies along for the ride. Anecdotally, Mrs. Jellyfish is not a gamer, nor is she a fan of Fallout, but even she couldn't help but get swept up in the immersiveness of the show, which just proves what we gamers have been saying all along. If you create your adaptation with the fans in mind, treating the source material with the appropriate respect, and competently execute on a clear and faithful vision, you will not only please those fans, you will also gain others who may or may not have been exposed to the video gaming medium, because it's like that source material was worthy and cultivated by fans all along. Because despite what some insist on telling themselves and others, it is possible to respect the source material while telling a completely new story. Personally, I think Fallout has set a new benchmark for live-action video game adaptations. It fills me with a sense of hope that the standard of others will lift as a result of this competent competition. God bless capitalism. But remember, I'm just a brainless lump. Who has the overwhelming urge to go back and play Fallout 3 all of a sudden? Uru, mate.